Good afternoon, um, everybody. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's session, uh, chaired by uh, myself, Jonathan Harris, um, and uh, going under the title "Natural Persons in Private International Law." And uh, as you will hear in a moment, covers a range of uh, important and uh, topical issues. Um, before um, before we get to, um, to to our speakers, um, since I have uh, the floor uh, for a moment, uh, this seems to be an opportunity for me uh, to express uh, some thanks uh, on behalf of the journal. So I shall take that uh, opportunity. First and foremost, of course, uh, to everybody uh, at the University of Cambridge who's made this a uh, reality, uh, to Richard, to, to Pippa, to Louise, to everyone else who's wearing a red badge, and no doubt various people who aren't wearing a red badge uh, who uh, made this happen. So thank you very much to them. Thank you very much to all of you uh, for supporting uh, our uh, conferences uh, through attendance and through our uh, speakers. We are really uh, very grateful. Um, this also seems an opportunity for me to thank our editorial board. Uh, many of the members of that board have served for a long time. Uh, they do a great deal of uh, refereeing uh, and other work to support uh, the journal uh, behind uh, the scenes, and we couldn't possibly uh, make the journal work uh, without uh, all of their efforts. And I thank uh, the editorial board uh, very much, uh, and, and many others, I, I might say, who are not on the board, who've assisted us with uh, the refereeing activities, which are core uh, to, our, to our work. So thank you all uh, very much. When we first started the journal in 2005, uh, Paul and I thought we had a reasonably good idea for a specialist English language journal in the field, but were slightly bothered by the idea that if it was such a good idea, um, why hadn't anyone done it before? Um, and would any of you write for us? Um, and um, Paul hit on what I think was uh, the best idea we ever had, which was to launch with a conference um, to get people together uh, and to get people interested in the journal and writing for the journal, uh, hopefully. And we launched the journal in 2005 in Aberdeen with a launch conference. I think it's fair to say that since then the conferences have become absolutely integral uh, to what we do and what we're about. And this opportunity, uh, which I think is perhaps more or less unique, uh, to bring people together at all different stages of their careers from any jurisdiction um, to interact uh, with one another uh, and hopefully in due course to submit papers to the journal which we accept uh, regardless of uh, the place of origin or the seniority um, of the author. Our criterion is very simple, it is uh, merit uh, of the piece and that is all. But. The last and perhaps most important thing uh, I want to do uh, is to express my thanks as I try and do uh, to assuage my guilt on these occasions to Paul. Um, Paul um, is uh, the driving force behind uh, this journal. Paul does most of the work um, of this journal where I'm uh, gallivanting around uh, and uh, without Paul's uh, dedication uh, to the journal it certainly wouldn't be uh, what it is. So it's a particular um, uh, delight to me um, that the first person I'm about to introduce is Paul, but I can't express my thanks to Paul uh, enough. Okay, um, enough, enough of that. Um, and turning to um, the, um, turning to the uh, panel, I will introduce our speakers uh, one by one. Um, and as it so happens, uh, going first are Paul Beaumont. Um, I've said enough about you, Paul, I'm not going to give you any other build up. Um, and um, uh, Jane, uh, uh, Jane uh, Holiday from the University of Aberdeen. Um, and also uh, Lara Walker from the University of Sussex. Now they're talking to us about um, Brussels 2A. And they're talking to us about um, conflicts um, between the place of habitual residence uh, and the place of refuge, and how, if at all, mutual trust operates uh, in that uh, context. So I will hand over to them. Oh, 
Well, good afternoon, everyone. I uh, just want to begin by uh, thanking everyone for the opportunity for actually presenting the research here this afternoon. In April 2014, we began our research project, which is funded by the Nuffield Foundation, to look into the effectiveness of the child abduction provisions within Brussels 2A regulation. And in particular, we wanted to look at the way Article 1168 of Brussels 2A regulation is operating within the European Union, whether parties' rights, such as hearing the child, were being protected. The procedure within Article 1168 allows the courts of the habitual residence of the child to issue a new decision ordering the return of the child where the state of res refuge has issued a non-return order on the basis of one of the exceptions within Article 13 of the 1980 Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction. The exceptions to returning the child under the Hague Convention are that the left-behind parent consented or acquiesced to the abduction, or that the child would be exposed to a grave risk or physical or psychological harm if they were returned, or they would be placed in an intolerable um, situation, or the child themselves objected to their return. Such a decision under Article 11.8 by the courts of the child's habitual residence must be accompanied <coughs> by an Article 42 Brussels 2A certificate, but with the abolition of the exequatur must be enforced in the state of origin. So in essence, what we have within Article 11.8 is it allows the state of the child's habitual residence to reject another member state's court's decision not to return the child and to insist upon that return. Now, in order to be able to evaluate how this procedure was operating, we needed to gather as much data on Article 11.6.8 from each member state. But this actually proved to be quite challenging. Our first approach was to contact all the central authorities in each member state to collect the data on Article 11.6.8 proceedings from the date Brussels 2A came into force in March 2005 until the end of February 2014. However, unlike the Hague abduction cases, which do have to go through the central authority, Article 11.8 proceedings do not and therefore the responses to the questionnaire were by no means comprehensive. Other factors also hindered the ability of the central authorities to supply the data, and these were lack of human resources, lack of a comprehensive database, or in some cases, such as Greece, any, a lack of a, a computerised database at all. In addition, unlike the Hague Child Abduction Convention proceedings, where jurisdiction is generally concentrated, in most member states, any court that hears family disputes can hear Article 11H proceedings. And the fact that these applications are often heard in first instance courts means that they are largely unreported. Thank you, Jane. Well, it may come as no surprise that we conclude that the system is a failure. And if a system is a failure, it's probably best to repeal it. And that is our primary recommendation. Um, why uh, repeal it rather than just let it continue to fail? Well, because it raises a lot of false hope and expectations for usually left behind male parents that they might still get their child back when in fact they won't. So um, that's the sort of primary uh, conclusion. Uh, the, however, there are things that uh, we would recommend could be done to improve the Hague system, the Article 13 return system, because in a sense we would rather we deal with these things at source rather than trying to lock the stable door after the horse is bolted, which is the approach of Article 11 of Brussels 2A. So what you should have in a well-functioning a legal order on child abduction is a very quick return proceedings in the country of refuge. The Brussels 2A system tries to achieve that. Reality is it's not working, but that's another story. And um, you should have in those adjudications 
quick returns by um, the judges. The problem, one of the problems we've identified with, with why judges are sometimes reluctant to return children is that if they think there may be a risk of harm with the child returning, they may not be able to satisfy themselves that sufficient protective measures are in place to allow the handover of the child back to the country of habitual residence. One small thing that could help to improve that, but not insignificant, would be to clarify that Article 11 of the 1996 Children's Convention, which is now in force in all the member states of the EU apart from Italy, and Italy are about to ratify it, I'm now reliably informed. Um, that Article 11 allows protection measures to be taken in cases of urgency which do not have a limited territorial effect, unlike um, the measures that are currently available under Brussels 2A, which are under Article 20, which refer back to national law but, but only have uh, limited territorial effect. So the, the problem we have at the moment is that Article 62, Paragraph 1 of Brussels 2A says that the 1996 Convention only applies between EU member states in relation to matters not governed by the Brussels 2A regulation. And it's at least unclear whether these Article um, 11 protection measures which are recognised by operation of law in the other member states of the, or the contracting states of the 1996 Convention are within matters governed by the Brussels 2A regulation. In any revision which we're about to have of the uh, Brussels 2A regulation, it would be sensible to clarify that Article um, 11 protection measures can circulate, Article 11 1996 Convention protection measures can circulate within the EU. That would have the benefit of ensuring that an order can be made, for example, to say that the left behind father can only have supervised access in relation to supervised contact in relation to the child until the courts of the habitual residence have the time to actually deal with the case. So the beauty of that is you make the order in the court of refuge but it actually applies in the court of the virtual residence, the country of the virtual residence, until the matter is actually before the courts there. So there's no gap, whereas there is a gap at the moment. <coughs> one other recommendation, which is that one of the reasons why sometimes courts are reluctant to send the child back is because the mother is facing a threat of criminal proceedings in the country of the virtual residence. And the mother therefore won't go back with the child because of those criminal proceedings. And that can lead to a judgment that it's actually going to do serious psychological harm to the child to not to go back without the mother. If we had a rule that said that if the mother returned with the child, the criminal proceedings would be dropped, it would considerably help. The idea that we could actually get that through in a Brussels 2A revision, I recognize this idealistic, but I'm making the point nonetheless. Another advantage of Article 11 of the 96 Convention, small advantage, is that you can get urgent measures for access while the Hague return proceedings are pending in the Court of Refuge. Again, it should be clear that within the EU you can use that tool so that you don't lose the contact between the left behind parent and the child. And often, in the real world, what the left behind parent really wants is ongoing contact. They don't want full custody. And if you can ensure that they get that contact, they don't lose the contact, in quite a lot of cases that will, in the end, be sufficient and that would reduce the problem. Another recommendation is that um, <coughs> all member states of the EU should be required to provide legal aid for 1980 convention proceedings and that they shouldn't be permitted to make a reservation under Article 42 uh, and uh, 26 of the Hague Convention, now that the EU has exclusive competence in relation to the 1980 Convention. It seems to me somewhat anomalous now that the EU has exclusive competence that we have a wide variation in practice within the EU on the issue of whether legal aid is required for Hague cases or not. 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. Our other recommendations are on the basis that the Commission may not have the confidence to propose scrapping the Article 11 Brussels 2A system, and therefore we make some recommendations of what they might do if they were trying to reform it. The first one would be to <coughs> excuse me, concentrate proceedings in the same way that Article 13 um, Hague proceedings are generally <coughs> concentrated. Now, it has to be said that there's no requirement yet within the EU to concentrate Article 13 proceedings. So this recommendation would, in my view, cut both ways. And, and we would like to see concentration of proceedings uh, in all uh, Hague cases, Article 13, the Tongue Order cases, and if we have them still, Brussels 2A, Article 11. Because you will then have the benefit of specialist judges who actually understand the problem, can deal with these cases as quickly and efficiently as they need to be dealt with, because the longer the delays, the more the child assimilates in the new environment and it becomes totally unhelpful and unhealthy to send the child back. So the countries that work well are indeed the United Kingdom and the Netherlands that have concentration of jurisdiction and do deal with these cases efficiently. It's quite clear that the countries that don't have concentration of jurisdiction and specialisation take far too long and they undermine the nature of the system. There is one possible exception to that and that would be in Article 11, 6 to 8 proceedings where custody proceedings are already um, well advanced in the court of origin, in the habitual residence court. Uh, it may be then too late to concentrate the jurisdiction in the hands of the specialist judge. So you might have to have an exception. Um, <coughs> I'll try and rush through the next couple of recommendations. The, the Article 11 8 proceedings at the moment do not make it clear that the return order can only be granted on the basis of a full welfare consideration, a best interests analysis. And in fact, the European Court of Justice in the Povsey case said that you can make an order just in order to get the child back to have a hearing. Well, we would like to reverse the Povsey decision on that. We would like to clarify that you only make this drastic step of asking the child to come back if you are deciding on the merits that that is the best outcome. And furthermore, it should only be done when you're deciding <coughs> that the residence order, the custody, should be in the country of habitual residence. There are some English cases where judges have used it to actually just reinforce contact in England, which is ridiculous and doesn't fit the terms of the regulation at all. Um, and then, pretty much lastly, we would like to see some improvement, as we've noted, the hearing of the parties, the hearing of the child, uh, is pretty chaotic, yet the Article 42 certificate, is the whole abolition of the exequator, is based on the idea that you guarantee that the parties have been heard, and that you guarantee that the, the issues raised in the country of um, refuge have been properly considered by the country of habitual residence. We feel, therefore, we need to do more to ensure that the parties are actually heard and the child is heard whenever it's appropriate for the child to be heard. And we need to do more to ensure that the certificate is properly filled in. We have examples of English High Court judges answering questions yes and no, which actually require articulation, but they still just fill in yes or no. And I mean English High Court judges, family division not people who should, who don't know much about it. So if even they are making a mess, you know, you can see how problematic the situation is. So that's, that's what we, uh, a very quick summary of what we would recommend should happen. Thank you. I should say as the last note that um, Lara has agreed to answer all questions from our... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for that um, masterful exposition of the situation. I'm sure there will be questions uh, later. Um, but I think uh, uh, we should uh, move on uh, now.
um, to the succession uh, regulation. Now, from time to time, I try and get friends and colleagues, perhaps over a drink, to take interest in the succession uh, regulation. Uh, something I'm fairly, fairly passionate about uh, myself. And uh, it tends to elicit one of two typical responses. Either they make their excuses uh, and go somewhere else, um, or um, you get the sort of response, it's got nothing to do with us. Uh, that's something that we didn't enact, and we don't need to know uh, anything about that. Thank you very much. So I'm delighted uh, uh, that um, our next speakers are going to tackle a, a subject that's dear to my heart about why the succession re regulation matters very much and why um, those, um, uh, the ambit of the regulation may be rather wider uh, than may uh, first uh, appear. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce two speakers who, who've been great supporters uh, of the journal. Uh, Professor Janine Carruthers, who was very much involved uh, in the uh, launch of the conference way, uh, the journal of the conference way back in 2005, and Professor Elizabeth Crawford from the University of Glasgow, and I'll hand over to them. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Jonathan, for your introduction. Now, there are many observations, detailed observations, which could be made on the technical content of Rome 4, uh, the Regulation 650 2012. We refer to it as Rome 4. The purpose of our talk is not to appraise the regulation uh, article by article, but Jonathan will be happy to conduct such a session in the uh, bar this evening <laughs> on that particular theme. Uh, rather, what we intend to do in the time available is to outline the possible effects of that instrument on the estates of UK nationals and also on assets which are situated in the UK but belong to nationals of other member states. And what really we want to do is to demonstrate that the decision by the UK not to opt into Rome 4 does not mean that the persons, uh, such persons who are UK nationals or property within the UK belonging to other nationals are unaffected by the regulation. We're drawing many of the thoughts that we're uh, referring to today from an article which we've published under the name Speculation on the Operation of Regulation 650 2012, Tales of the Unexpected. And I think that title probably says it all. So what we can't deal with today uh, can be read elsewhere. The instrument, Rome 4, was finalised on the 4th of July 2012 and applies to the succession of persons who die on or after 17th August 2015. And the focus of what we want to look at today is which persons and to what extent. The starting point is recital 82 of the instrument. In accordance with protocol number 21, on the position of the UK and Ireland, those member states are not taking part in the adoption of the regulation, they're not bound by it or subject to its application. The UK government decided in uh, December 2009 not to opt into the European Commission's then proposed regulation on wills and succession. And despite early intimation of that non-participation by the UK, the final version of Rome 4, though stating quite starkly this opt-out, nonetheless seems quite willfully blind to the situation as it transpired, that not all EU member states have adopted the regulation and the repercussions of that. Now you might say a defect uh, by way of omission in the drafting of the regulation is the absence of an acknowledgement that as a result of the decision of the UK and Ireland, and also uh, the position of Denmark, that there exist three categories of state for the purposes of this instrument. We've got the participating member states, by far the largest number. We've got the non-participating member states, of which there are three. And then we've got the third states, obviously external to the EU altogether. Now, the first category of state clearly is affected by Rome 4, that's the very purpose of it. 
Yesterday in the succession panel, Professor Bunuauti uh, spoke about the position of third state. So Elizabeth and I don't want to look at that today, but what we do want to consider is the position of the non-participating member states. Now in contrast with the position taken in Rome 3 on choice of law in wills and uh, in uh, divorce and legal separation, Rome 4 admits only two categories of member state. Uh, sorry, two categories of state. Rome 3 specifically refers to the participating member state and the non-participating member state. And it's commendable for that explicit recognition of the two categories and the implications of that. Rome 4, on the other hand, uh, I think can be criticised for the failure to recognise that there are the two categories of member state, those which are bound by it in which it's directly applicable, and those three member states which are not bound by it. So Rome 3 gives us an instrument for a discrete topic which is fairly containable and operates among that uh, group, that cohort of EU member states. Divorce is optional, death is not, and what we have to deal with is the fact of these two uh, groups of member states for Rome 4. How does the instrument actually uh, address that? On the assumption that the UK and Ireland and Denmark cannot be considered for this uh, purpose a member state, at least as far as the rules on jurisdiction are concerned, then they must be considered as full third states, if you like. No jurisdiction is conferred upon them by the rules in Chapter 2, even by submission of the parties. When we move to Chapter 3 of the instrument, though, uh, that chapter opens uh, on choice of law by enunciating the principle of universality. And it's clear that the regulation broadens its ambit uh, in relation to choice of law. The terminology changes from member state to state. Chapter 4 deals with uh, recognition, enforceability and enforcement of decisions. While legislative virus would suggest that as with Chapter 2 on jurisdiction, the rules in Chapter 4 are intended to apply only among the net of compliant member states, we have considered in the article in more detail that, uh, in view of the facilitative character of this instrument, some inroads into that principle might be admitted, but it's unlikely today that we'll, we'll have time to go there. Now, to recap, I think it might be useful, uh, we're aware over these two days, three days of the size, the sheer scale of our subject, and not everybody will be working in the detail of wills and succession, so there might be some benefit in giving a pre of the, uh, the content of the instrument. This regulation is quadruple in nature. Chapter 2, as I've said, deals with jurisdiction. Chapter 3, choice of law. Chapter 4, Recognition and Forcibility, and Chapter 6 introduces the European Certificate of Succession. In terms of Article 4 on general jurisdiction, as a general rule, the courts of the member state in which the deceased had his habitual residence at death shall have jurisdiction to rule on the succession as a whole. Article 21 is the general rule of applicable law, the law applicable to the succession as a whole shall be the law of the state in which the deceased had his habitual residence at the time of death, unless, by way of exception, it's clear, Monica, I'm not sure what you would say about this in the escape clause, it's clear from all the circumstances of the case that at the time of death, the deceased was manifestly more closely connected with another state, in which case the law of that state shall apply. However, by Article 22.1, a person may choose as the law to govern his succession as a whole the law of the state whose nationality he possesses at the time of making the choice or at the time of death. And there are various elaborations on that choice of law provision. In a clear symbiosis between the rules in Chapter 2 on jurisdiction and Chapter 3 on choice of law, where a choice of law has been made, and the choice is that of a member state, 
the parties concerned, it's an undefined concept, but the parties concerned may agree that the courts of that state, that member state, are to have exclusive jurisdiction to rule on any succession matter. So the parallelism there between uh, jurisdiction and choice of law. Article 20 gives us the principle of universality. The applicable law determined pursuant to the general rule in Article 21, or party choice in Article 22, governs the succession as a whole. So that means, importantly, that the unitary instead of the decision principle will operate, and purportedly at least, regardless of whether the assets are located in a participating EU member state, in a non-participating EU member state, or in a third state. Now, the Lex Successionis has a wide scope of application and it shall govern capacity to inherit, disinheritance, disqualification by conduct, liability for debts, uh, the reserved shares, restrictions on disposable, disposal of property, uh, and any claims which persons close to the deceased may have against the estate, which includes significantly uh, the principle of clawback. So that is the precy of where we're at with the regulation. Now, just before I begin my part, I, I was reminded of the, the old joke who, of the man who said that he understood that death is not optional, but he hoped an exception would be made in his case. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm talking, first of all, about the, the phenomenon of hybridity. Um, we use this term in private international law to describe the interface between a regulatory regime, that is, we're talking of EU regulatory regimes, and the world beyond that regime. Uh, and this hybridity manifests in various guises, geographical. Um, it's necessary to determine the physical extent of application, if any, of a European regime's rules. Uh, in circumstances where there are factual or legal connections with an EU state and a third state, uh, problems famously have arisen in relation to the Brussels One regulation delineating the geographical scope of the operation of its rules. Uh, and one of the points of debate in the drafting of the recast uh, was said to be the operation of the European rules in the international legal order, a euphemism uh, for addressing the rarely harmonious relationship uh, between EU member states and third states in civil and commercial jurisdiction and judgment enforcement, and in particular the implications of the existence in the member states of residual national rules of jurisdiction of widely varying content. This sort of area has given rise to interesting decisions under the heading of reflexive reasoning. Uh, then there is hybridity where subject matter is concerned, where there's an overlap between the subject matter covered by the regime and the residual national rules of participating legal systems, resulting in a struggle for supremacy. Then sometimes it's more uh, patent a disconnection clause uh, will recognize and aim to solve the problem of the ranking of instruments uh, to solve the problem for the forum where there is a, a possible struggle between an EU instrument and, or more than one and an international instrument in the same or cognate fields. But what we are dealing with in Rome 4 is I think different, new, uh, as the, the program evolves, it concerns the delineation of the extent of the operation of the instrument within the EU where you have um, EU member states which are not bound by that regulation. As to nomenclature, what we used were the expressions compliant member state, non-compliant member state, and third state. 
Um, but people have suggested that uh, non-compliant member state is perhaps wrong. It sounds rather inflammatory, aggressive, and there was never any obligation upon the UK to comply. We have the choice. Uh, Non-participating, we feel, is rather peculiar to Rome 3. And non-involved begs the whole question which we're hoping to address today. Uh, Non-complying might be better, but it trips off the tongue rather less readily than non-compliant. Uh, and so we'll stick with that. Um, how can it be that Rome 4 may affect persons connected with the UK or with property in the UK when we have not opted in? There on the screen are three possibilities of many possibilities. But if we think of those possibilities, a UK citizen who owns assets immovable or movable in a compliant member state, how common is that? Or the case of an individual who is judged to be habitually resident at death in a compliant member state or as a national and whose estate includes property situated in the UK. The case of a compliant member state national whose estate includes property situated there, but who at death is judged by whom as habitually resident in the UK. And we intend to paint a very few portraits illustrating, uh, we hope, this problem. Now, the outcome, we're conjecturing, the outcome will depend on a number of things, including, very importantly, the identity of the principal forum dealing with this, the anchor jurisdiction. Uh, the court which is most likely to take jurisdiction, um, either under Rome 4 or under our national rules, and bearing in mind the fact that in the UK we don't really think of this very often as a contentious matter. Um, and we don't often think in terms of jurisdiction. Uh, equally, the outcome will depend on the operation of the enforcement rules, which, as far as non-compliant member states are concerned, seem to us to be purely aspirational. And now picture. Having articulated these thoughts, um, we, we must test them, but um, I must say that when we were thinking of it, uh, we did think of this analogy of, um, you see there, the Corrie Brecon, which is uh, a famous uh, whirlpool off the west coast of Scotland near Jura, and uh, it's caused by turbulence at the spring tide. And uh, Jonathan said that his friends thought that the UK wouldn't be uh, interested or bothered by this, but actually I think we might be going into the vortex of quite a lot of trouble uh, with this particular regulation. And uh, you may <laughs> only those film buffs will recognise the, the, the photograph at the bottom. This is a story in a Powell and Pressburger film which used the Gulf of Corrie Vrecken as an essential part of the plot. And in fact, the lady couldn't access her fiancé across the Gulf of Corrie Vrecken, so she simply decided to marry somebody else who was on the mainland. <laughs> so um, we're now going to turn to the portrait painting. Okay. We're not just a double act, double act. We've <laughs> oh, got a few friends with us. <laughs> as well as Wendy Hiller, that's Wendy Hiller, famous actress. There are some cases where you can clearly say, while well, the succession is beyond the reach of Rome 4, safely beyond it. If we take a character, let him be Angus, who is a UK national, domiciled and habitually resident at death 
in a non-compliant member state, let's say he's a Scots habitual resident, he's got a state at death situated only in Scotland, then clearly he is beyond the reach. But that is about as straightforward a case as we can say. It would be the bulk of successions in our jurisdiction, but the clarity extends really only that far, I think. When we want to say who is within the reach, first of all, we have to take at face value certain of the assumptions which underlie Rome 4. First of all, that habitual residence at death is the preeminently appropriate connecting factor as a single lex successionis. And further, that agreement on that notoriously difficult factor will be readily achieved in any given case. Ease of identification of habitual residence really has to be taken as read for our purposes. First of all, Article 22, as I've said, permits a person to choose the law uh, to govern his succession as a whole, the law of his nationality. Uh, when we're looking at the cases which uh, are more difficult to judge if they're within or without the reach of Rome 4, we want to look at some portraits, people who have made a choice of governing law and some of whom who have not done so. And we'll start with that latter case because I think they're more straightforward. If we take the example of Guillaume. Let's say Guillaume's a French national, he's habitually resident in France, he's domiciled there, at least in the Scots view, he's got property both movable and immovable in France and heritable and movable in Scotland. Now if we assume an anchor jurisdiction, if you'll permit us that term in France, then in the view of the French Forum, Rome 4 will apply. The consequence will be that all property belonging to Guillaume, including that situated in Scotland, will be distributed according to French law. By the unitary rule, the Scottish Lexitas, in the French view, would not apply to heritable property situated in Scotland. Now, whatever might be the aspiration of Recital 37 of the instrument, a court in Scotland, if seized on the Cetus principle, would distribute property situated there according to its own bifurcated scissionist rule. So that would identify the Lex Successionis in respect of immovables to be the Scottish Lex Cetus, at least as far as the heritable property in Scotland is concerned. With regard to movables, the lex successionis in the Scots view would be the ultimate domicile of the deceased as determined by the Scots court. To the French court, applying Rome 4, domicile is entirely irrelevant. Now, the best that really can be hoped for here is that the Scots court on these facts would hold the deceased to be domiciled in France, giving us at least some uh, consensus as to result between France and Scotland as to the movable estate. If we take the converse situation, still we don't have any choice of law under Article 22, but if we say for this purpose that Nevin, a UK national habitually resident in Scotland, domiciled there in the uh, Scots view, so his connection is with the non-compliant member state, but He's got property in France as well as in Scotland. Now, this type of character is increasingly common as we've got UK citizens buying their second homes in the sun. Now, if we assume in this case an anchor jurisdiction in Scotland, the Scots court would seek to dispose of the heritable property in Scotland according to the Lexitas and the movable, Scot the movable property in Scotland according to the last domicile of Nevin, which, in our view, is likely to be Scott. <coughs> in the Scots' view, therefore, French law would govern the devolution of immovable property in France, and the Scots' domicile at death would regulate the distribution of movable property in France. But if we view the case through the lens of Rome 4, the French expectation probably would be that the Scots' court would have jurisdiction and that the Scots law, as the last habitual residence, would apply to the devolution of all property, wherever it was situated. <coughs> now you might say, well in Nevin's case, can we turn to Article 10 of the instrument on subsidiary jurisdiction? 
But if you look at the terms of that, it would not be satisfied because of the connections with Britain. Article 10.2 might be activated conferring on the French court of the CETA's jurisdiction to rule on assets there. But by contrast with Article 10.1, Article 10.2 is uh, restricted to assets located in the territorial bounds of the forum. In principle, the French court would want to distribute Nevin's immovable property in France according to his Scots habitual residence at death. Now that might lead us into the application of Romwa, which could be useful in this particular situation. And we don't have time to go through other characters. Nevin and Guillaume both in these cases had their habitual residence and nationality in the same state. If you take another couple of characters, you can look at them later if you're interested in this, where you have habitual residence in one country and nationality in the other, then the question of the applicability of Rome 4 becomes increasingly complicated. As an interim comment, what I would say is that these scenarios are not atypical. They demonstrate how the ambitions of the regulation are likely to be frustrated by the existence of property, especially immovable property, which is situated in a non-compliant member state but belonging to an individual who died habitually resident in a complying member state. We'll move now to cases very briefly where a choice of law has been exercised by the deceased party. This is an interesting uh, matter of interpretation of the regulation. Uh, who is able to exercise choice per Article 22? Can anybody play? Uh, it is established per Article 20 that uh, the law of any nationality may be chosen. So having thought about this for some time, we conclude that uh, the constituency of electors is not limited. Uh, there would be a temporal difficulty if uh, the constituency of electors were limited to people who it could be proved by which law in, by, uh, and in which court to be habitually resident um, at death uh, or at the choice with a compliant member state. Uh, it could be that one could be led into lots of difficulties. Uh, a person who is habitually resident at choice might not be habitually resident at death uh, in a compliant member state, could his choice be invalidated? Um, it looks to us as if the choice, as I say, the, the, the constituency of electors is not limited. And that's strange because it might mean that a person could choose uh, a law which in its own private international law, does not allow uh, party autonomy in the matter of choice of law on death, as indeed is the case with the conflict rules of Scotland and England. Uh, so that is an interesting uh, uh, matter to ponder. <coughs> and actually, if we're right in this, party choice might be used as a, an escape route um, to avoid the application of what might be feared to be uh, the applicable law qua habitual residence at death. So um, we have two to go through uh, quickly for you. Um, Alistair. Now here we have somebody who is uh, a British citizen, estate principally in Scotland, owning a holiday home in Portugal. If he elects to have the law of his nationality apply at death, uh, he hopes to guard against uh, the possibility that he might be thought to be habitually resident in Portugal at death, and he wishes to do a little bit of forward planning. And uh, if Scots law is the anchor jurisdiction, how would it deal with a choice of this kind? Uh, would it allow Alistair to disapply Portuguese law par lex citus to the devolution of his house in the sun? Uh, Portuguese law would probably not be bothered about this choice by Alistair, but Scots law might be. 
and uh, it could be that uh, a Scots court could get round this by applying Portuguese law in the round, uh, including therefore Rome 4 and bringing it back to Portugal. Um, this seems really rather complicated, but I suppose might be possible. Christian to finish with. Now, here we have somebody of German nationality and domicile, habitually resident in Scotland, dying, owning heritable and movable estate partly in the UK and partly in Germany, electing by will to have German law govern the succession. So Germany would be the anchor jurisdiction. Um, a Scots court would be likely to be engaged. The Scots and German courts, by different reasoning, would agree that German law would govern the succession to Christian's property, heritable and movable, or movable, immovable, I should say, in Germany, and his movables in Scotland. But the conflict which would result arises in relation to the immovable property in Scotland, which Christian wishes to have German law govern. And so a Scottish court would have to consider what it felt about this. And it is strange that it's another subtle problem that we haven't entered into this, but yet we may be confronted with problems of this kind. And a pragmatist would think that it was in, not inappropriate that German law should apply to the distribution of Scottish heritable property, but it is um, uh, unprecedented and it would require acquiescence uh, by the Scottish court in this uh, outcome. Now to our conclusion. We feel that the continued existence of the scission principle uh, in the applicable law rules of non-compliant states is awkward. There does seem to be some support in the UK for a unitary rule of choice of law on death um, as to property. Um, but as long as the scission rule remains, it is a stumbling block to achieving harm in cross-border uh, successions and the smooth operation of Rome 4. Second, uh, the introduction of a measure of party autonomy is novel to us, and it does seem that British courts might have to address the question of whether they're going to accept this expression or not. Thirdly, uh, we simply don't know what's going to happen to the um, enforcement provisions which have been so carefully laid out in the regulation. Uh, it seems that they would apply within the net of compliant countries, obviously, but again, we're, it's awkward when you consider uh, the, the United Kingdom and Ireland, and what's going to be done is practicality uh, going to win. Now, I have two things to say at the end, which um, I hope may spark some thoughts. We've had a lot of interest and uh, enjoyment thinking about these matters, but it is legitimate to ask how many contentious successions will present, how far these difficulties will arise. You have to keep matters in proportion. Uh, domestically, the number of contentious successions is small and cross-border ones smaller still. Uh, such disputes as arise may not be litigated, they may have an outcome through mediation or negotiation, we shouldn't exaggerate the dangers. Uh, but it does seem to us that paradoxically Rome 4, which is supposed to be an improvement, may in fact create more difficulties uh, in the United Kingdom. Corrie Breton. Uh, the other point is that progress in private and international law harmonization is lopsided if we don't move as one. and. We're saying that we are not shielded from its operation in the United Kingdom because we have not opted in. But the other thing is, but our declining, for our own good reasons, I think, 
not to opt in has the capacity to undermine the operation of the regulation in its legitimate ambit. And uh, we, we have to wait to see how practicality, convenience and comity and acquiescence and matters of this kind operate when these cases come to court. Thank you. <coughs>Thank you for your introduction. Um, I'm very pleased and honored to be speaking here. Um, well, the title on the program was actually truncated, so <laughs> it's, uh, it actually sounds more mysterious and intriguing <laughs> than my uh, full title, uh, which is jurisdiction. Uh, it too was added to that, uh, anonymous <coughs> online authors. Well, um, well, still it's an, an odd one out in this uh, session on natural person. Uh, it has not much to do with a natural person. Uh, there are uh, many legal persons operating in this uh, topic. Um, I, I suppose it's, the topic is so unconventional uh, that the organizers had a hard time uh, fitting in to any <laughs> place. <laughs> well, um, so unconventional, unconventional, but uh, its practical significance uh, cannot be underestimated. Um, I will deal with this uh, scenario. Uh, when a defamatory content has been posted on a website, uh, that's represented on arrow number one on the illustration, uh, the injured person may wish to seek injunction or damages against the author, uh, number four on the arrow. But uh, if the author has acted anonymously or pseudonymously, uh, the injured person will first have to unmask him or her by demanding the internet service providers uh, disclosure of some information, information enabling the identification of uh, the anonymous author. Uh, more specifically, um, first, it may be necessary to ask the host of the server or website uh, to reveal the internet protocol address, IP address used, and timestamps. Uh, that's represented number two over there. Uh, once those details have been obtained, then 
uh, the Internet Access Provider may be asked to reveal the name of the subscriber. Uh, the idea being that the subscriber is the likely author. Uh, the arrow number 3 represents that. Uh, this presentation will consider uh, jurisdiction and choice of law questions uh, which uh, could arise in this process. Uh, the consideration of those questions should take into account the respective interests of the stakeholders involved in this scenario. Firstly, the injured person has interest in obtaining access to justice to vindicate his personality rights. The author, on the other hand, has interest in maintaining his or her anonymity. Thirdly, the internet service providers do not have inherent interest in maintaining the author's anonymity. Their interest lies rather in avoiding liability towards the author for breach of duties of confidentiality. Uh, the duties resting on contract with the author or on any applicable statute or common law. The internet service providers may be exempted from this liability if they obey disclosure orders of courts. We will now examine different approaches to unmasking anonymous authors as taken in Japan, France, United States, and England. Under Japanese law, the legal base of disclosure order is a statutory right against the internet service providers. The relevant provisions essentially say disclosure may be demanded if the alleged infringement has clearly taken place and there is a justifiable reason for obtaining the disclosure, as in the case where information sought is necessary to claim damages from the author. As a substantive right, it may be asserted in and outside courts. However, as a substantive right, this right may be asserted only where Japanese law is applicable under the Japanese choice of law rules. The claim based on this right is characterized as taught or generally assumed to be so by commentaries. But the taught characterization is somewhat awkward uh, since the claim is not for pursuing taught liability of the internet service providers. Rather, it is only a preliminary step to claiming the author's tortious liability. I would prefer to see this statutory right as emanating from an overriding mandatory provision rule of the forum. Moving on to the question of jurisdiction. In a case where interim relief was granted to order Twitter, Inc., a California com company, to disclose the IP address and timestamps of anonymous tweets, the Tokyo District Court relied on what is known as the Japanese version of doing business jurisdiction. The Japanese version of doing business jurisdiction is more restrictive than the traditional US version in the sense that the action has to relate to the defendant's business contact with Japan. So it's a specific base of jurisdiction rather than general or jurisdiction. It is nonetheless a broad jurisdiction as it does not prescribe the method of doing business. So it is capable of capturing defendants who have no fixed place of business in Japan, but conduct business in Japan by means of internet from outside Japan. Twitter Inc., a California company, comes within this jurisdiction because it conducts business in Japan by providing its online service to Japanese residents in Japanese language. This jurisdictional ground has been relied upon <coughs> in suits against other internet, foreign internet service providers, such as Facebook as well. Without this head of jurisdiction, it would have been difficult to find jurisdictional grounds in suits against such companies. 
since the claim for disclosure is based upon special statutory right, the jurisdiction rule for tort cannot be relied upon, while the doing business jurisdiction is available, irrespective of the legal nature of the claim. Moving on to France, uh, in French law, disclosure orders may be based on the provision in the Trust in Digital Economy Act. Obviously, it's my English translation of the Act name, uh, promulgated in 2004. Uh, Article 6.2 reads, the Internet service providers hold and retain the information, enabling the identification of any person who has contributed to the creation of the concept, content of services of which they are providers. The judiciary authority may require the internet service providers to disclose the information mentioned in the first paragraph. To obtain disclosure, another possibility is to rely on a general rule of civil procedure. Article 145 of the Code of Civil Procedure reads, if there is a legitimate reason to preserve or establish prior to any legal process, the evidence of the facts upon which the resolution of the dispute depends, preparatory inquiries may be ordered. The application of those rules became an issue in a recent case seeking disclosure from, again, Twitter. In this case, Twitter Inc., a California company, did not dispute the French jurisdiction, but it did contest that it was subject to the obligation to retain information under the French Trust in Digital Economy Act, arguing that it was doing no more than required by the law of California. Twitter also disputed that the provisions of this act were overriding mandatory rules. Citing those arguments, but without giving them full consideration, the court simply stated that it was not apparent that Article 62 of the Act was applicable in the present case. The court instead relied on Article 145 of the Code of Civil Procedure, uh, the second one, uh, to order disclosure, again simply observing that it was applicable in international cases. The commentaries on the case commonly regret that the court didn't clarify the circumstances in which Article 62 of the Trust in Digital Economy Act would be applicable to foreign internet service providers. As regards Article 145 of the Code of Civil Procedure, uh, one commentator has argued that its application would have been better justified on the basis that the French court had jurisdiction in the case, France being the place of injury since the offending tweets written in French had been received in France. It seems to me that since the rule of Article 145 is procedural, it is applicable as forming part of the Lex Fora, the law of the forum, and no further choice of law question would arise. On the other hand, it would be necessary that the French courts have jurisdiction in a case. In the absence of jurisdictional grounds similar to the Japanese version of doing business jurisdiction, the jurisdictional rule for tort might be the only possible ground, however awkward that may be. Moving to the US, the approach in the United States is very different from those in Japan and France. In the United States, the anonymous author may be sued in the name of John Doe, and then a discovery order called DOE uh, subpoena may be issued to the internet service providers to unmask John Doe. As it is a procedural order, it gives rise to no choice of law question. The debate is focused on jurisdiction and jurisdiction over John Doe rather than jurisdiction over internet service providers. This can be contrasted with the Japanese debate. Since there is no uniformity in detail rules in, within the United States, in this paper, I will examine a few recent interesting cases. Uh, just last year, the Texas Supreme Court 
considered whether the court must have personal jurisdiction over the author, uh, the defendant, John Doe. A petition was filed requesting non-party Google to disclose the identity of a pseudonymous blogger under Rule 202 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure, which allows a proper court to authorize a deposition to investigate a potential claim. It's a broad power. The notice was sent to the blog email address. Uh, by the way, as in this case, the internet service providers often notify the anonymous author that disclosure has been sought. The blogger in this case filed a special appearance without revealing his identity, asserting that his only contact with Texas was that his blog could be read on internet there. The Supreme Court held that the proper court must have personal jurisdiction over the potential defendant. It recognized the burden on the plaintiff could be heavy, where the potential defendant's identity is, was unknown. But the court refused to interpret the rule to make Texas the world's inspector general. On the fact of the case, the Supreme Court declined, denied jurisdiction. There is, however, a recent California case where personal jurisdiction over an anonymous author was upheld. In this case, third-party discovery was initiated against WordPress.com, a California company, which hosted the offending blog. The court upheld personal jurisdiction over John Doe's, the defendants, because they had purposefully, in the words of the court, purposefully availed themselves <coughs> of the services of a company located in California. This was notwithstanding that the plaintiffs were English local politicians and initiated the discovery in California to learn if their political rival in England was the author. <coughs> it cannot, however, be assumed that the courts of the home country, home state of the internet service providers will invariably uphold jurisdiction over anonymous authors. In one not so recent case, the Virginia Circuit Court quashed a subpoena against America Online, a Virginia company, holding that the minimum contacts requirements were not satisfied since the effects of the defamatory posting were felt more in Pennsylvania. Moving to England. In England, the legal base for disclosure order is the Norwich Pharmacal Order. In the leading case decided in 1970s, uh, which was unrelated to online defamation, the House of Lords held, if through no fault of his own, a person gets mixed up in the tortious acts of others so as to facilitate their wrongdoing, he may incur no personal liability, but he comes under duty to assist the person who, who has been wronged by giving him full information and disclosing the identity of the wrongdoers. Norwich Pharmacal Order is a procedural order and therefore raises no choice of law question. Unlike in the United States, where jurisdiction over the anonymous author, John Doe, is discussed, questions of jurisdiction over internet service providers featured in a few English cases. In one such case, Norwich Pharmacal Order was sought against the defendants, US companies who hosted the websites publishing defamatory statements. The claimant applied for permission to serve the claim form out of the jurisdiction on the ground as provided by the civil procedure rules that a claim is made for an injunction ordering the defendants to do an act within the jurisdiction. Namely, in this case, disclose the information sought in England. The court granted permission without discussing the question of jurisdiction. It is to be wondered how the respective interests of the stakeholders would be weighed in the forum convenience inquiry. 
to recap, under Japanese law and presum presumably also the French Trust in Digital Economy Act, a disclosure order is based upon a substantive right. Accordingly, both choice of law questions and jurisdictional questions arise. One, one of such questions is whether the rules for tort are available. In the United States, England, and France, a procedural disclosure order, procedural order is available. As such, it is subject to the lex fori, and no choice of law questions arise. On the other hand, jurisdictional questions do arise. In the United States, debate is focused on jurisdiction over suit against the anonymous author, on, anonymous online author. Whereas in England, jurisdiction over suit against the internet service provider, providers featured in a few cases. Either way, the jurisdictional analysis is not straightforward. Amongst the various approaches represented in this survey, I would prefer uh, the US approach, uh, since the anonymous author has a greater stake in the case than the internet service providers. And the internet service providers cannot be expected to adequately represent the interests of the anonymous author. Thank you for your attention.